Good evening all, I'm Duti Lamba and this is the Tuesday Night Vision of Asia. Welcome to our daily South Asian news segment coming to you from our studio located in Astoria, New York. Beginning the episode, here is what is happening all across. More than 8 million cases of the novel coronavirus in the world today with at least 437,000 deaths. In the United States, we have reached more than 2.1 million COVID-19 cases with at least 116,000 deaths. It is being predicted that the United States could see more than 200,000 deaths from COVID-19 by October of this year, while states across the country continue to reopen. About 18 states are still seeing an upward trend in new cases here in New York, the state is seeing low number of COVID-19 hospitalizations since the start of the pandemic. We again urge all our viewers to continue practicing social distancing and wear masks to protect yourselves as well as others around you. Also, if you are a South Asian working on the front line or own an essential business, please share your story with us on events at itvgold.com. We are consistently focused on bringing forth empowering voices on real-time issues and tonight we present more on the opinions on the ongoing discussion about George Floyd's death, about racism and police reform, along with information on the rise of domestic violence in the nation during coronavirus. More on the changes being demanded as nationwide anti-racist protests and demonstrations continue, here are the headlines. Navneet Bhalla on rise in domestic abuse during COVID-19, Manvi, New Jersey. Lakshmi Sridharan on George Floyd, police brutality and anti-blackness solved. In an American's martial black life, solidarity with George Floyd, New Jersey. It's time for a short break. Stay with us on Vision of Asia. Voice of the community will be right back. Beginning the episode, we are presenting more perspectives on the case of George Floyd. And now Rasha Brooks, today President Donald Trump signed an executive order for police reform which he hopes to improve standards of forces and information sharing along with other improvements in the system. President Trump opened his remarks by expressing sympathy to the families of victims of police violence and pledging to fight for injustice. Anti-racist protests continue to spread leading to call for defunding of police departments and taking down of historic statues. Bringing more insight into the issues being discussed on systemic racism, what is needed from the government and the impact of police brutality on America, we spoke with Executive Director of SALT, South Asian Americans leading together Lakshmi Sridhar. Lakshmi discussed the response of SALT to George Floyd along with her views on the change of needed policy and resources available through SALT. We have been um, extremely disheartened um, of course, about what happened to George Floyd being murdered at the hands of police. And this has been um, an issue at SALT that we have spoken about in the last several years. Um, and, you know, it just continues to be part of a cycle of brutality and violence by law enforcement against Black communities in this country. And we believe that at SALT, as non-Black communities of color, um, it's really important that we understand what's happening here and that we think about our own advocacy um, around policing, around hate violence, around other issues that impact our community um, within this context. And, and we feel like that's very important. We did issue a statement as such, and um, we will continue to do so um, and support the efforts um, to address. 
you know, talking about what has happened, you know, um, my question to you would be, what do we tell our younger generation and how do we explain the situation to them? They're watching everything, um, you know, on social media, on news. Uh, this entire situation has gone viral. Even Rayshard Brooks case that just happened uh, this past weekend also has gone super viral because of that. Um, what kind of a, a conversation should we be having with the younger generation? Yeah, I think that's so critical. And, you know, as somebody um, who is a bit older now, I actually feel like I've learned actually so much from the younger generation. In 2015, SALT had a Young Leaders Institute program that was a leadership development cohort that was entirely focused on the theme of confronting anti-Black racism in the South Asian community. Um, and we had 16 young people who are a part of that cohort whose projects we actually hope to share in more detail in the coming weeks. Um, who did incredible work on addressing anti-blackness um, from the perspective of law enforcement, from institutions. Uh, many of them were in college and were addressing that on their campuses, um, in their community, among other community institutions and religious institutions in the South Asian community. So I actually think that we have a lot to learn from them. Um, and I do know that you know all eyes are on this right now. And I think it's really important to continue the conversation, both to rise up to the call from the Black community and from the movement for Black lives to show up now as non-Black people of color, but also to do our work to really examine anti-Blackness within our communities. Let's talk about this issue of anti-Blackness, Lakshmi, because, you know, this is something that's definitely uh, come up in several conversations in the last few weeks with uh, the case of George Floyd and other cases that have come, you know, consecutively after that. How do you explain uh, this uh, evidence of anti-Blackness in the South Asian American community? And if we were to have a discussion on what that means in a, in a society to have that, you know, and what does that reflect? How would you answer that? Yeah, I think it's a very difficult conversation. I know that people have struggled to try to have this conversation within their families. And there are organizations like Equality Labs, like um, the National Queer South Asian Network, um, and others who have created um, spaces to have this dialogue um, and this conversation. Um, SALT was very um, happy to co-sponsor the um, in defense of, uh, South Asians in defense of Black Lives event that Equality Labs, DRUM, and many others um, organized this past weekend. And I think it's it's important that we have those types of conversations. Um, I think there's a lot of inroads into the conversation. Um, our, our partners at Equality Labs have also taught us it's really important, um, specifically as Indian Americans, to think about um, caste and colorism um, and religious discrimination and how those issues are actually um, at the root of anti-Blackness within our communities. And so I think, um, you know, I think many of our communities are still trying to figure out um, what, what is the entry point for those conversations? Because I know many of us have ended up frustrated with relatives and community members and family and others when trying to have these conversations. But I think more and more resources are being developed by uh, many of these organizations who are on the you know, leading edge of these discussions. Um, so I think it's, it's important that we, um, we start there. How important is it for the South Asian American community to be an ally uh, of the Black community right now? Sorry, I think you froze a little bit. Can you Did I freeze? It? Yes. Yeah. I I froze. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to like mark this. There was a little freeze in there. Yeah. I was just asking, how important do you then think it is for us, South, the, uh, South Asian American community or other uh, minority community to be the ally uh, for the Black community right now, to stand in the causes, to be their support and have the discussion? Yeah, I think it's extremely critical. Um, you know, as people of color and especially as South Asian communities, you know, we have, um, I think, greatly benefited from um, the struggles um, that the Black community has had to wage in this country. Um, of course, the most notable being the civil rights movement, which um, I think it's important to remember was also very, very violently repressed by our government. I think there's a lot of talk about um, you know, wanting to see peaceful protests and all of that as a, as a pathway to change. But I think we have to remember that there was um, so much violence um, deployed against Black communities during the civil rights struggle. Um, so I think that's really critical to remember. And then I also think as we as a community also um, consider our reliance on the police and policing for so many of the issues that we also face in our community, it's important for us to interrogate that. Um, and, and really think about how we're relying on racist institutions.
more on systemic racism and its impact on communities this friday is june 19th which marks the end of slavery in the u.s virginia governor announced that he will make the day an official state holiday in new york governor signed legislation requiring state police officers to wear body cameras and legislation to create a law enforcement misconduct investigative office in the state this is happening while statewide demonstrations continue to demand for justice as well as an end to systemic racism and are looking now for significant changes and reform in the entire system. In New Jersey, hundreds of Indian Americans showcased their solidarity as well as support for black lives by marching at Oak Tree Road. Many spoke to ITV Gold on the importance of Indian American communities supporting the black community and its important causes. Let's take a look. We just wanted to organize this march and vigil for the black lives that have been lost due to police brutality and just white violence. Um, you know, the Edison community is majorly an Indian and South Asian community, and this was the best way to show our solidarity. Uh, the reason why I'm here today is to show support for the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests. It's extremely important, uh, one, as a society, but what most people don't realize is that it's happening, it happens to be happening right here on Oak Tree Road. And Oak Tree Road, specifically for this movement, is very historical. If you go back to Edison's history and you go back 10, 15, 20 years, and Edison, use of force issues related to the police department is something that we as a community also faced. It's something that we dealt with and overcame successfully. The reason why this is so important is because now we can actually say that one, this is Edison itself is a very diverse community. We have every single demographic present, um, every single economic de de uh, demographic present, and we've overcame use of force issues specifically in our town. It's important to show solidarity, solidarity that we should be a model not just for uh, other towns and neighboring, but also America. We have the right, everyone should be heard, everyone should be protected, and we should live and stand by one community. Hello, my name is Samuel Marshall, and I've lived in Edison, New Jersey for most of my life, and I'm here on Oak Tree Road in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and to help continue the fight for justice that African Americans across the country have been fighting for for the past few weeks now. But really, what I definitely want to call attention to is that it's a fight for justice that's been going on for definitely the more than the past two weeks. It's really been a fight that's been over 400 years long. And more than anything else, I just want to be here to honor and pay respect to all the different people who have come before me to allow me the freedom and opportunity to stand here today and to honor their memory, both those like George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, who live, whose lives were taken by systematic um, um, police violence, and also those whose names you're not allowed to know, those who died on the Middle Passage on the way to this country, those who died fighting for their right to vote, for their right to fair treatment throughout the society. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! say that it's really important to support Black Lives Matter because everyone should be treated equally and no one should be like considered less. No one should have to go through this again and I think it's really important that everyone should take at least some time of their day to show some support and come to these protests.
Yeah, if you can't protest, there are many other ways you can sign petitions, so just try to do your best. Hi, we're trying to raise awareness for, um, about the racism, rampant systemic racism in this country. It's gone way too far. Black people have been dealing with this crap for 400 years now, since 1619 to 2020. It's getting ridiculous. Um, abolish the police and abolish prisons. Thank you. Your name? Oh, my name's Layla. Spell, spell. <laughs> This is, this community is the Black Wall Street of the Indian community. You know what I mean? This is their Tulsa. This is what has become about because of the civil rights movement. You and know? we've experienced racism here for a very long time because b before that, this used to be a community filled with Italians and we kind of took over. Yeah, and and it, there were a lot of white supremacists in this town before, you know, the Indian community came over. Yeah, bit. they did. And, you know, it's a good thing, though, in my opinion. You know, the town's booming. Property values have increased dramatically. You know, the school system's now top 25 in the state. Stevens so, is yeah. one of the best schools in the country. Yep. And, it, and that's, it's all because, really, of the Indian Asian community. And that's something that needs to be said. And I'm very proud to be from Oak Tree Road today because as we can see, they all stand with every community. We're always open to equality for all, especially Black Lives Matter because that's a that's something we really are stressing today. We really condemn what has happened for the blacks and we, we want the equal treatment for black and white people in America because America is for everyone. And it is, for, it is an immigrant country, so it should be for all. Thank you. Black Lives Matter is not a moment, it is a movement. Growing up black is not a temporary thing. You don't get to choose when you wish to be black. Your skin always shows it. Growing up black is having, having to be everyone's advocate because you know what it feels like to be alienated, but people rarely being yours in return. Growing up black is having to relearn all the history in your textbook because writers thought it was more fit to say that Rosa Parks was tired than to say the civil rights bus movement was preordained, organized, and planned. <laughs> Walking into a store and the store owner following you around because they think you're going to steal. Growing up as a black woman is having to constantly monitor your hairstyles out of fear that someone else will deem your fro unprofessional. Growing up black is tiring. If you're tired of wearing your mask that restricts you every day, then you could not imagine the life of wearing a permanently placed mask forced on you to police you and keep you silently in line. short break on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community, come right back to us. Welcome back, this is Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community, and I am Aditi Lamba. Looking now at the concerning issue of domestic violence, many are confirming that domestic abuse or violence is on the rise during the COVID-19 pandemic as victims find themselves quarantined with their abusers and can't get away. Many survivors are also finding it difficult to adjust to the economic and health ramifications of COVID-19 with issues of food and job insecurity prevalent in several immigrant communities. It's also important to remember that domestic violence was already a global pandemic long before COVID-19 outbreak and our current social as well as economic climate has now exacerbated the domestic violence crisis in the nation. Shedding light on domestic abuse rights and its various forms, as well as resources, we spoke with Manavi's Executive Director Navneet Bhalla in New Jersey. 
Manvi addresses the unmet needs of South Asian American women affected by violence. A very important discussion. Here is Navneet Pala. So domestic violence is an epidemic where the abuser exercises power and control over the victim. So there's a pattern of behavior where in any intimate relationship, the abuser is exercising power and control and that escalates over a period of time. So you may not necessarily see physical um, or sexual assault at the beginning, but as the abuser gains more power and control, you see various forms of abuse. And I'm so glad that you asked the question about various forms because very often, especially in our community, there is this um, misconception that domestic violence is purely physical violence, and that is not accurate. So it's really important to reiterate that domestic violence comes in many forms, and there are a various um, a range of abuses. For example, you can have, absolutely, you can have physical violence, but you can have verbal abuse, psychological abuse, you can have financial abuse where you, the abuser is controlling all the finances um, of the, the victim. You can also have abuse where their isolation essentially because their movement, whether it's in person or online, is being totally controlled by the abuser. And sexual violence and domestic violence are two very distinct forms of abuse. So to define sexual uh, violence, it's basically any act of sexual nature where you have not given your consent or where there is coercion. So there are two distinct forms of abuse and there's a whole range, um, as I mentioned earlier. Yes, for sure. And in terms of reflecting on uh, the immediate impact of COVID-19, um, you know, this 20% increase uh, seems like a really large number. What is your personal take on it? And have you seen an increase um, of uh, domestic violence during this pandemic? So that's an interesting question. And this is something that all culturally specific organizations and domestic violence agencies across the state have been speaking about in, in New Jersey and across the country. That although we know there has been a significant uptick in domestic violence cases, um, domestic violence abuse, that hasn't necessarily translated into the number of calls going up. And we know the reason why all domestic violence agencies, um, and we've all been discussing this across the state. The main reason is because if you think about being in quarantine with your abuser, if you're in quarantine with your abuser during a pandemic, you have very limited options or choices or opportunity to reach out for help. So although we are seeing a more intense form of abuse taking place, so, so we are definitely seeing intense cases, forms of abuse that we didn't necessarily see before um, and much more severe, the, the frequency or number of calls um, in, in the past few weeks has not necessarily increased, although recently we are seeing that they are starting to increase. And I think it's because um, the abuser is so in control of the lives of many survivors who are in quarantine with them. Right. And in terms of these survivors, how are they, they reacting to you when you're interacting with them right now? What are some of their biggest challenges that they're facing? And um, are they perhaps afraid a little bit due to this pandemic and the fact that they are constrained in two specific places? Yes. Um, so there, there's, you know, COVID-19 is a pandemic and at the best of times, um, our survivors are in fear of being cut off and in fear of isolation and in fear also reluctant somewhat to report to law enforcement um, because of various reasons like their immigration status, for example, um, where their immigration status is dependent on the abuser and they rely on their abuser. Um, for, for their status and the ability to stay here and financial security. So if you think about how they might feel during a global pandemic, absolutely. They, we're seeing and hearing situations where the survivors have to balance their need for food, shelter, childcare, financial security, food security, health care, insurance, immigration status against the daily abuse. So 
where most people during a pandemic, as we've seen, have, have grappled with, you know, basic things like getting groceries, making sure that they, and we all have the privilege of being safe in our homes. Yeah. For survivors, I think they have to make this judgment call where they see that the abuser is also the person who's providing all those fundamental securities, food, shelter, childcare, and these, they, there have been situations where they're reluctant to report because their abuser is the person who is the one who's earning the income. And, and in extended family settings, it's even more difficult because they're relying on the extended family support for their children. Uh, but the financial dependency, I think, makes it much harder for them because then they realize that it's much more it's, they feel, I should say, that it's harder or more dangerous to be subjected to COVID-19. So they, they would rather suffer the abuse in their homes. We would like to take this time now and send our condolences for the demise of Indian American popular community leader and the chairman of the Federation of Indian Associations, FIA, Mr. Ramesh Patel. A true leader and a proud Indian, here is Ramesh Patel's son on his father and his legacy. Truly a sad loss for the Indian American community. He was a man who valued character over wealth and power. He searched for good in each individual and never focused on their flaws. He empowered and encouraged them to be a better person, whether it was his family, friends, or mere acquaintances. And once you were in his inner circle of trust, he was extremely loyal, almost to a fault. My father was never one to look back at his previous achievements, but rather always looking forward to what more he could do next. In victory, he would always share the credit. In defeat, he shouldered the blame. He would not let us be defined by our failures, but rather guide us to find our way to success despite the temporary obstacle. He was essentially a born leader. There's always a special bond with the father and son. In my case, it started at a young, impressionable age and strengthened over time through moments we shared together. I am privileged, honored, and extremely fortunate to be a son to my father. And this wraps up our show for the night. Remember to send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations on our show. Email us on events at itvgold.com or follow us on Facebook at ITV Gold. You can also now subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch many of our popular shows for free. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is Vision of Asia and I am Aditi Lamba. Take care and be well.